um, Associate Professor Paul Gardner. Um, I'm based at the University of Otago in New Zealand, um, uh, where I work in the biochemistry department. Uh, I get to teach into our genetics and biochemistry programs, um, mainly covering sort of bioinformatics, data analysis, things like that. And if I'm a very good boy, I'm allowed to work on um, some of my research interests and in non-coding RNA evolution, analysis of genome variation. And um, more recently looking at uh, what are the features of uh, gene function as well. My connection to RFAM is I used to be the senior staff scientist in charge of RFAM um, back when it was at the Sanger Institute. Um, that was between 2007 and 2011. I had to look that up on my CV because uh, I'd forgotten all the dates there. Um, and I managed a very small team, Jennifer Daub and, and John Tate, who was our web developer. Um, there and we had some absolutely fantastic summer students as well working on the project so adam wilkinson who's now a group leader at oxford i just saw and um, ben moore who now works at illumina and uh isabella osuch who's at gsk now as well we're all involved in the project so it was a fun time So I managed to look up the document that I wrote for Alex Bateman when I applied for the job. Um, there, I sort of listed a few ideas in there. Um, so some of the things we had planned to do and, and may or may not still be on the to-do list um, was one thing we were considering was an RFMB, um, where to, to put some of those more unreliable families, sort of push them sideways um, in there and that's, that may be something that's still worth considering as well as a um, one way of dealing with some of the quality control issues uh, with some of the the uh, the families that that are currently in our fam that are uh, that may not have lots of evidence to support them um, and of course people are discovering new transcribed regions that may or may not be um, functional as well um, uh, are being discovered at a very high rate so somewhere for those to go um, may be useful. Um, I talked about ideas about mapping onto the PDB as well and um, pulling in some of the structural information for RFAM and using that to help curate the alignments, which I think has been uh, working pretty well for a number of years um, now. <clears throat> I mentioned motifs in that document as well. So, RNAs are fairly modular um, and there are several recurring motifs. So things like transcription terminators and, uh, uh, you know, tetra loops and, and things like that are, are quite useful features to see within an RNA structure there. So marking those up is, is quite handy. I also talked about in that document, wickifying the database. Um, so, um, before I started, there weren't the same connections with Wikipedia uh, that RFM has now um, <clears throat> there, but I would, was also talking about, you know, going a little bit beyond that, which I think Anton um, managed to incorporate. So, you know, wikifying both the, um, the alignments and the structures as well um, in there, which I, I never quite managed to, to do that. Um, so well done to, to you guys for getting that off the ground. Um, I had a note about uh, developing better search heuristics as well, so speeding up those infernal searches, which were um, which were a bit slow back in those days. We we didn't, didn't have the benefit of all that work from Eric Nauroki and and Sean Eddy at that stage um, there, and they've done a fantastic job at speeding speeding infernal up. <clears throat> and then pseudogenes is one of the really big things that. Um, I think is is still a, a pressing issue um, for RFAM is there are millions of um, non-coding RNA derived pseudogenes that make um, that make genome annotation and uh, searches pretty challenging um, for RFAM as well. And um, I'm not sure we've got a fantastic solution yet there, but I was sort of wondering about connections with DFAM as well. Um, there. So the repeats database DFAM um, is a useful sister database for RFAM. And, and so using that 
as a quick way to get an idea what is it likely to be a pseudogene and, and sort of you know trying to deal with those um, early in a search may be a useful thing to think about. <clears throat> and then of course, you know, I <laughs> I was sort of surprised I, I did this. I, I sent Alex a, a list of all the things that were wrong in RFAM as well. So I, I discovered lots of alignments that had issues and uh, structures that had some problems as well, which is always a fun thing to do to uh, someone who's as passionate about bio-curation as, as Alex is. So the first big challenge we had was was actually getting RFAM working again. So RFAM had been essentially mothballed um, when I arrived. Um, so Sam and, and Alex had, had elected to work on, on these fancy new and, and exciting non-coding RNAs called micro RNAs and, um, and had kicked off a sister database to RFAM, um, Merbase. Um, and so Merbase was, was getting quite exciting then and, and uh, was and these microRNAs were getting quite a bit of attention. And so when I arrived, um, very little of the code actually worked. And um, and a lot of it was depending dependent upon BioPearl um, as well, which made life pretty interesting. So if, what BioPearl was doing, every time I started a search, um, because we were using BLAST pre-filters at, at that stage there, all the BLAST hits were being read into uh, memory as a um, biopearl uh, object as well. Um, and so the, the searches could suddenly use enormous amounts of memory on the machines that we were uh, running these searches on as well. And so what was happening in my first summer at RFAM um, was every time we'd, we ran a, a little RFAM query, we would basically lock up all the machines that people were using. Um, there and then I'd get shouted at quite a lot by everyone in the room, <laughs> which was great. <clears> that <throat> was a good time. And so I also had a very ambitious summer student, Adam Wilkinson, who um, he built a lot of the microRNA families and the snow RNA families as well that summer. And so he'd be running the, you know, like 20 or 30 of these searches at a time um, there. And you know, did a huge amount of work for our fam, so contributed a lot of the, the families that were, were desperately needed at that time, but also broke uh, a lot of the infrastructure that we were depending on. Um, so once we got all that fixed and working, um, people were a lot happier with me, at least within the, uh, the X fam group. <clears throat> um, so that was, you know, the initial challenges um, would just getting started and a lot of that was was scale and I think that's still a huge problem for, for our fan as well so how do you deal with you know the enormous amount of genome sequences that are that are being generated um, now and you know can we annotate all of them quickly and cleanly and as accurately as as possible um, certainly the thing I enjoyed the most was building new families as well. Um, I really enjoyed, you know, producing nice clean alignments with good consensus structure annotations as well. Um, it often felt a little bit like Christmas, you know, finding a new highly conserved family with, you know, lots of co-variation and, and getting a nice clean alignment for that uh, was a, a lot of fun. And, you know, it was a little bit like solving a Sudoku puzzle or a Rubik's Cube or, or, or something like that. Um, so. It was, a, it was a good time, but also challenging. So RFAM today, I don't get to use it nearly as much as I would like to um, during my day. Um, mostly I'm, I'm being distracted by pesky students, um, certainly for the last last few months. Um, but yeah, what, what I've noticed is RFAM is an absolute dream to use. Um, now, so you have a very smooth interface. Um, it looks beautiful. Um, and you know, there's lots of information for each family and it's uh, quick and, and easy to, to access. Um, and you know, you're constantly generating lots of new and, and exciting families uh, as they're being published as well. So the bi-curation um, side of things seems to be going, going pretty well. 
um, which is great. So I think Anton and Iona and uh, Nancy and, and yourself have, have done a fantastic job keeping it going as well and uh, keeping it very current and, and you know, still the go-to place in, in my book for uh, all your uh, non-coding RNA alignments and, um, and many of your RNA-based questions as well. Well, you know, obviously it's going to be bigger. Um, <laughs> hopefully um, scaling as well, um, continuing to, to scale well. Um, I think that's going to remain a, a big challenge for quite a long time as well. Um, I'd like to see pseudogenes handled well um, uh, within RFAM as well. So. You know, it's it's still a big challenge how to deal with you know hundreds of copies of of uh, you know non-coding RNA. It's clearly homologous, and so you do want to see those those matches um, there, but not necessarily functional um, as well. So de degrading. So some way of flagging those, I I think, would be good. Um, possibly links to expression databases as well. Um, would be something to to that would be good to see in, in 20 years time so you know if i go and find you know a new and interesting non-coding rna family <clears throat> can i see whether or not the transcription of this non-coding rna is conserved and across you know what sort of evolutionary time scales can i see that that transcription happening as well and, and you know is there variation and and say the conditions that you might see this this RNA being expressed in, or um, you know, developmental stages, things like that. And then, you know, I think junk RNA is is a um, is something that needs to be appreciated more as well. That you know, transcription can just happen, <clears throat> and not and and from you know non-functional parts of, of many genomes there. It seems to be a, a fairly prevalent activity. Um, so there've been a growing number of papers now where people have produced say random um, DNA sequences and inserted those into, into you know, some cells. And you can see you know, levels of, of transcription happening from those regions as well. So that, that's fairly strong support for this idea that junk RNA is, is certainly something that exists. And so developing some quality controls for, for dealing with, with some of those issues um, might be something to, to think about going, going forwards. And, you know, I don't have a good solution yet, but um, uh, it's, it's certainly something that, that might be worth having a crack at over the next, next 20 years. It'll be good to see.